Welcome to Experience EDA 2020. As many of you know, we had originally planned to hold this conference in Kananaskis in March. However, better late than never, to kick things off this morning, I invite you to enjoy O oh Canada, performed by Kaya Bruno, a 14-year-old Cree girl who comes from Samson Cree Nation in Musquachies, Alberta. Nikina ni taskinan kisa ki hetinan o takawekiak ni te hinak ki wapam tinan so ki ki wetinok pokoite o ta o Canada kasito skatinan no tawinan kana weita o canada kini poi samatinan o canada kini poi samatinan how inspiring. Now I would like to introduce someone who is no stranger to our organization, someone I consider a friend and a great national leader in economic development, Mr. Ray Wanick, to say a few words on behalf of Can Do. Hello and good morning and welcome Economic Development Alberta, and on behalf of CANDU, its 13 board of directors and staff, we are pleased to work with Economic Development Alberta again for another year and wish you every success for this year's 2020 conference. We have many things to do today, and I, I want to begin, as we always do, and wish everybody not only in our immediate circle, but throughout the world, the best day that they can have. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Musham Rick L. Lightning from Muscochis. Tanse. Wapu Muscochigastun. Pasqua Mustosawas is like the Utsian. I'd like to thank everybody. I hope everyone's having a great day. I've been given the honor to um, do the opening prayer and a drum song, the honors uh, blessing song for the conference. The conference is economic development. Since the beginning of our people and, and all the people from all over the world came here, economic development has been always been the, the, very, the key foundation of the growth of Alberta. So the Cree people, the Dakota people, the Blackfoot people, the Dene people, all the tribes across Alberta and Canada have always been part of the economic development of the growing of Canada. We, it's been a partnership of understanding and trust. And I hope that everyone remembers that when we talk about economic development, that the partnership between our peoples the Indian peoples of, of Canada, Alberta, we are, all, we are all in this together for the long run. So I'll say an opening prayer, and then I'll do the blessing song, and I'll introduce our... We have an amazing group of young people coming here today to be, to be dancing for you, to give you a little bit, uh, sharing a little bit of who we are. Ha-no-tawi ma-o-se-wa-tsi-in, ha na skwin an mi ni Wapata ni chai sino, kwasagam utwisto, apaksita, skiwe mios, be natamuk. Umogan manaskamo, I mean a kutakiska, wapatama. Suwem nan, utnama wan etamun, seksun, oxun. Wawisum oxun, wasagamaskin, and palm of it. Utna kaugi, with a guanma. The magamer, and no tawima, say what's see. Yeah, 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 yeah,
So uh, where I come from, we have an amazing people that are going to be here. We have Daniel Rowan from Bear Streak Drum. They're a young group of brothers that have been singing since they were little guys. And, uh, and now they've grown to be the world... If there were like, uh, they've been known all over the world for their singing. They're amazing young men. And then we have Jennifer McGillivray from Muskeg Lake, Cree Nation, Saskatchewan. She's going to be doing Women's Fancy. Kara Morn from Enoch Cree Na Nation, Alberta, Women's Jingle. Flower Okamal from Muscatice, Alberta, Women's Traditional. Marcus Behagen, Onion Lake, Cree Nation, Saskatchewan. Fat Men's Fancy, Tevin Lilchild from Muscatice, Alberta, Men's Grass, Adrian Lachance from James Smith Cree Nation, Saskatchewan, Men's Traditional, Jody Lilchild from Muscatice, Alberta, Men's Chicken. So you have, to decide, you have a whole bunch of people that are coming here to show you all the different amazing things that uh, in, a, in a world of powwow, and so with that, I'd like to hope you have a great day. Hope your conference is successful and you all go home with open hearts and uh, remember that we're all in this together. Thank you. Hi, hi. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Elder Lightning, Bear Street Drum Group, and all the extremely talented dancers. We truly do have a rich cultural heritage in this province and our country. Now I would like to invite Premier Jason Kenney to bring greetings on behalf of the Government of Alberta. Thank you to everyone who's gathering today for the Experience EDA 2020 Annual Conference. You know, all of you are champions of Alberta's culture of enterprise. And I truly believe that is one of our greatest assets that will help us to get through the COVID crisis and recession and to emerge stronger than ever. That's what Alberta's government is trying to do through uh, our recovery plan, a bold and ambitious plan to build, uh, to diversify and to create tens of thousands of jobs. But we need the support, of course, of all of the economic development agencies and uh, chambers of commerce, business organizations, and grassroots entrepreneurs who are really the lifeblood of enterprise in the Alberta economy. So good luck to all of you in your deliberations today. I know that uh, out of this will come concrete plans for a continued progress uh, to pave a brighter future for Alberta. Thanks very much, Premier Kenny. We appreciate the priority you and your team are placing on economic diversification and recovery. And thanks to each of you who have signed up to be with us virtually over the next two days. We know you would all rather be sitting in Kananaskis right now. So would I. Unfortunately, that's not an option. So over the past few months, we have tried to get as creative as possible with our virtual platform. We did not want this to be a conference to be a one-way Zoom call because we know all of us are Zoomed out. I'm pleased to say that we have found an EDA way to provide quality speakers with current content, integrate interesting live sessions, and deliver unique Made in Alberta networking experiences over the next two days. Like when we meet in person, you get out of the conference what you put in. If you're at this conference and not currently a member of EDA, we encourage you to become one. Check out our updated Community Economic Development Training Program, including information about our economic development for elected officials and resilience courses that are going to be online starting in January. For those of you in Alberta who registered before the event cutoff, you should have received your experience box by now. Don't forget to bring them to the networking events tonight and tomorrow night. They're filled with fantastic Made in Alberta products. For more information on the products and companies showcased in the box, check out the link on our conference website, specific to the experience box. It's been a tough few months for Alberta businesses. Take a moment to enjoy the diversity we have and continue to support our local business community in the months ahead. Now, I would like to invite Mary Lee Pryor, EDA's 2020-21 president, to come and officially welcome everyone to experience EDA 2020. Good morning and welcome to Experience EDA 2020. I am very excited to be here and I hope you are too. 2020, as we all know, has been a challenging year navigating the new normal during this pandemic. For us as individuals, in our roles as EDOs, and in assisting our business communities. COVID-19 has had staggering impacts across the global economy, affecting industries, labour markets, education systems, and social behavioural norms. We have all had front row seats over the last several months, witnessing the pandemic's disregard for all borders and sectors of industry. The ramifications have spared no one, slowdowns in global trade, supply chains, and our ability to attract global investment and talent from our jurisdictions have left our communities, decision makers, and business leaders to pick up the pieces. But this is not new information for you as economic development practitioners. You are the feet on the ground assisting and guiding our Alberta business communities through the pandemic. Pivot, engage, partner, innovate, create, develop, help, and listen are just some of the terms you have heard and been asked to do more of over the last few months than ever before. All critical to stimulating business performance to enable our communities to thrive and continue moving forward. 
As president of the Economic Developers of Alberta, I want to thank each and every one of you for all that you do and all that you have done within your communities over the last year. Experience EDA is your time to rejuvenate, take in new ideas, network with your fellow EDOs, community leaders and industry leaders, gain new knowledge and innovate ideas. Let's refuel for the year ahead. Now, as Leanne mentioned, we have tried to get as creative as possible with our virtual platform, creating an EDA way to provide quality speakers with current content, integrate interesting live sessions, and deliver unique Made in Alberta networking experiences. So stay tuned and engage with us over the next two days and experience EDA 2020. For our opening keynote this morning, I would like to extend a special thanks to our sponsor, Strathcona County, and invite Shane Olson, Acting Director and Manager, Commercial Development, Economic Development, and Tourism for Strathcona County, an EDA board member, to say a few words about Strathcona County and introduce our keynote speaker. Shane. Thank you, Mary Lee, for that introduction. On behalf of Strathcona County, we're pleased to be a sponsor of this year's conference. Before we kick things off with the opening keynote, Meet the Millennials, on behalf of all of the economic developers within the association membership in Alberta, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you personally, Mary Lee, for your leadership during these challenging times and uncertainty that we faced in 2020. Thank you. Now a little bit about Strathcona County. Set in the center of Alberta's energy and agricultural heartland, Strathcona County is a thriving and successful, vibrant community of almost 100,000 residents. Strathcona County is made up of urban areas of Sherwood Park and a large adjacent rural area of farms, acreages, and smaller hamlets. We are home to 75% of the hydrocarbon processing in Western Canada. Strathcona County is a leader in environmental conservation and 55% of our land is within the UNESCO Beaver Hills biosphere. With a focus on economic, governance, social, cultural, and environmental sustainability, Strathcona County is committed to balancing the unique needs of its diverse community. You know, when the pandemic started in the spring, we knew we wanted to step up and support the economic developers of Alberta in a meaningful way. Our contribution was a key decision made this past spring by our former Director of Economic Development and Tourism, Mr. Jerry Gabinet. I'm confident Jerry would be pleased knowing that we will all collectively carry on his legacy of excellence and training in our profession. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Tony Colson, Group Vice President, Public Affairs with Environics Research. Mr. Colson works on policy and communications research with clients at the international, provincial and national level. This includes communication studies ranging from assessing public knowledge attitudes and reported behaviors on a given topic through to audience segmentation, message development and communications testing. Much of this work is undertaken in support of efforts to raise public awareness or manage organizational reputations. Tony has a graduate degree in political science and business administration along with nearly 20 years of experience in policy, research and communications. One of the Environics recent pieces of research is around the six key tribute tribes of Canadian millennials. I'm really looking forward to hearing about these different tribes that are within the millennial segment. These include, of course, lone wolves, engaged idealists, bros and Britneys, diverse strivers, critical counterculturalists, and new traditionalists. Tony will be speaking about the research and how this cohort is going to make a difference in economic development into the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Tony Colson. Hi everyone, good morning. Very pleased to be speaking to you, albeit remotely and not in uh, beautiful Kananaskis as originally planned. For those who don't know me, I'm Tony Colson with Enveronics Research. I, um, I grew up in Alberta, in Tabor, and I attended the University of Lethbridge uh, before moving to Ontario for graduate school. After that, I settled in the Ottawa area. Um, my work takes me all across the country, which is great. And for the last decade, I've been working pretty extensively in Alberta, 
which has allowed me the opportunity to travel widely throughout the province and to meet uh, Albertans from all walks of lives, which I've really enjoyed. Um, today I'm going to be talking about millennials and uh, how you can connect with them. Uh, my overall plan is to tell you a little bit about millennials and why they're important, to tell you uh, how millennials are um, distinct from prior generations, and uh, some of what you need to know in order to connect with them, if you're marketing or communicating, how you can reach them. Millennials are a uh, much discussed generation. They've kind of been the it generation for some time. Um, there's all kinds of uh, material, as you can see. Everybody wants to know how to market to millennials, how to manage millennials, what their lives are like, um, what they're interested in, how to get them to give to your cause, etc. Millennials have um, been called a lot of things, some of that flattering, some less so. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why so many um, different perspectives uh, as we go through. Start with a few basics. Um, First off, millennials are a large cohort. They're about a quarter of the Canadian population, um, which does make them an important market. They were born uh, between about 1980 and 1995, which makes them around 25 to 40 nowadays. Um, they're quite culturally diverse as a segment, or as a cohort. Um, they're also diverse in other ways, which we'll touch on. They're quite well educated, and they've been shaped by the influence of technology. Um, some might say that they're tech savvy. So when it comes to cultural diversity, one of the um, measures is the um, proportion identifying as visible minority. And in the millennial generation, that's about 27%. And that compares to 16% in Gen X and 7% of boomers when they were about the same age. So millennials considerably more uh, diverse in that respect. Millennials also grew up in more diverse families. Um, so um, as compared to the pre-boomers and boomers, for example, uh, substantially fewer millennials lived with both of their parents um, throughout their formative years. Millennials are also more educated than Gen X. 70% um, of millennials hold a um, post-secondary degree or diploma compared to only about 55% in the preceding generation. And as we've seen, um, digital literacy is um, an important element defining this um, cohort. Um, this is a question where we ask millennials themselves what differentiates their generation from, uh, from others. And the kind of most frequent group of mentions have to do with digital literacy and social media, and et cetera. And it's substantially like, quite a ways ahead of all uh, other types of mentions. So that's a little bit about um, kind of where millennials come from, and what they're like. And now let's look at some of the implications of that. One of the things that's often said about millennials is that they're a late launching generation. And that means that, for example, because they stayed in school longer, um, they got around to forming their families partnering up a little bit later, uh, they invested in real estate later, et cetera. So let's look at some data in that respect. Um, <clears throat> one of the implications of staying in school longer um, and attaining more education than prior generations was a higher proportion of millennials with student debt and among those with debt, a higher average debt. And as we mentioned, um, millennials also um, form their families a bit later. So um, married or common law by age 25 to 29, substantially less among millennials than, um, than boomers, for instance. Home ownership um, by age 30 uh, suggests that millennials had caught up to prior generations. So um, they might've got started a little later, but uh, when it comes to buying homes, they're, they're catching up or they have caught up. Um, you can see that they're, um, um, their mortgages and the value of their homes are higher than private pre previous generations as well, um, meaning that they're buying more expensive homes. And um, buying those homes is leading to um, higher 
debt to income ratios um, compared to their predecessor generations. And um, it's also contributing to higher net worth. Um, their homes are a substantial portion of the assets that give them that high, uh, high net worth. So that's a little bit about um, some of the, the formative aspects of millennials. Now let's delve into what they're like. Um, what are their values and their aspirations? So compared to prior generations, based on an analysis of their social values, we find millennials to be avid consumers. They take more joy from consumption. They care more about uh, aesthetics. They like to be original and unique, and they have greater confidence in advertising than previous generations. Um, and that confidence is that advertising will lead them to quality products or services. Uh, millennials are also more adaptable and socially liberal than preceding generations. They're more sensitive to the environment. They show optimism and to a greater extent. And we've talked about their enthusiasm for technology. This is another source of data that uh, substantiates that. Um, should point out that in youth, every generation shares certain values, things like risk taking, um, attraction to crowds, uh, some acceptance of violence, uh, ostentatious consumption, those kinds of things are common among youth, regardless of the generation. Um, whereas the things on the screen are those that differentiate millennials from other cohorts while they're, uh, um, you know, in their younger years. Uh, another way to look at this is we asked a sample of millennials, what are some of the things you really want to achieve in your life? So what are your goals and aspirations? The top of their list is family and relationships, um, followed by financial aspects like stability and freedom, uh, career advancement and um, objectives. Um, also on the list are vacations and travel and home ownership as well as getting more education, although that's much more of a short-term focus than a longer-term one. We also asked millennials about some of their um, challenges that they face in their work or their careers. Um, the most common mention has to do with a weak economy or the lack of jobs, um, followed by competing priorities like family and time pressures, personal limitations like a lack of confidence, for example, uh, their lack of skills or experience or a lack of support or acceptance in the workplace. <clears throat> in this question, millennials were asked if they um, have enough money now to lead the kind of life they want. Only about a third, and this was in 2016, only about a third said they did. But out of that two thirds who didn't, 72%, so about 45% overall, felt that they would get there in time. So um, it's a little reflection of that optimism we discussed. Uh, another indicator um, of what millennials are like, um, two thirds say they give to charity or have given to charity in the past 12 months. And um, among those, um, about two thirds said they've given less than $300. The fact that millennials were giving, um, or you know, such a high proportion of millennials were um, giving to charity caused quite a stir in uh, in charitable circles, um, created a flurry of activity with people trying to learn more about millennials and figure out how to get them interested in their causes and have them uh, donate. Um, we also find um, a good proportion of millennials who volunteer time and um, that's comparable to um, the prior generations. So when we look at um, all of these different data, it's hard to um, settle on any of those stereotypes we identified at the outset, you know? Um, but that's not that surprising. It's hard to imagine that everybody who's between 25 and 40 thinks the same way. And if you think about prior generations, I'm sure that's also true. There are certain characteristics that um, you can attribute to a generation, but uh, there's also diversity within the generations. So what this, um, what this speaks to is the need for a more nuanced analysis of uh, millennials or any other group. One of the um, specialties of environics is segmentation. And um, this is something we did looking within the millennial cohort 
uh, according to social values, what are the um, social values or the world views or motivations or um, outlooks that people hold and that guide their behaviors and their attitudes and their opinions. And um, by analyzing millennials by their social values, we found these six distinct segments. Let me give you a little primer on social values so you can uh, understand this a bit better. Um, social values, we've been researching in Canada since 1983. Uh, we've been doing it in the US since 1992. Um, it's a system of measurement that tries to get underneath attitudes and opinions and measure kind of where people come from, what motivates them, what their uh, worldview is like. And um, one of the tools we use for understanding values is this, uh, this map space. And um, the two axes run from authority at the top to individuality at the bottom. So values associated with authority relate to respect for traditional authorities, whether that's in the church, the state, uh, in the workplace, et cetera. So hierarchy, um, respect for uh, elders, respect for um, different authority figures. Uh, values related to individuality at the bottom of the map uh, involve a questioning of that authority and uh, in some cases rejecting authority. And then on the um, horizontal, we see values ranging from survival to fulfillment. On the survival side, it's um, the bottom of Maslow's uh, hierarchy, people are trying to deal with material needs. And then over on fulfillment, material needs are taken care of and you're fulfilling your post-material, uh, your goals. Um, so what's great about this space, um, by combining the different um, values, you can come up with these quadrants. So there's status and security there. There's authenticity and responsibility. There's idealism and autonomy. And there's exclusion and intensity. And then this is useful in that you can plot different um, cohorts or segments of a population and see how they compare. You can compare um, societies over time, you can compare societies to each other, or you can compare to cohorts, like I said. So here we've got um, the pre-boomer or elder segments. The boomers starting to spread out a bit. The Gen X, even a bit more uh, diversity. And then millennials, the most diverse uh, generation to date. And you can see they're spread quite across the, uh, the value space, reflecting different value orientations of the segments. So here, um, new traditionalists um, at the top, close to respect for authority, diverse drivers over here, have a little more materialistic focus, critical counterculture and engaged idealists more in this um, idealist space. So um, quite a range of, um, outlooks within the millennial generation. Let's look at these different segments briefly. So the new traditionalists are about 10% of millennials. They're spiritual and religious people. They prefer traditional family structures. They're practical consumers who watch their money and they have a low need for status recognition. The diverse strivers um, love crowds and attention. They're connected to their communities. They believe in duty and they want to get ahead and they love to spend money and care about brands and their appearance. The bros and Britneys are kind of mainstream youth. They're urban and suburban. They're not looking to change the world. They're enthusiastic users of tech. Um, they have a need for status recognition. The lone wolves um, actively disengage from society. They reject authority. They're kind of rebels without a cause. They're utilitarian in their consumption and they're skeptical of the world around them. The engaged idealists are socially aware and engaged. They hold progressive values, they're ambitious, and they find fulfillment through work. So they need to be employed in things where they can get that um, fulfillment. And they're highly connected and tech savvy. And then the critical countercultures, it's a small segment, 4%. Uh, they're civic minded and globally conscious. They share progressive values with the engaged idealists, but they're more critical and rational. They're autonomous and they um, care deeply for nature and the environment. So as you can see, um, there's quite a range of uh, outlook within the millennial segment uh, cohort. And um, that's true of other um, cohorts as well, just not to the same extent. So if you want to co connect with millennials, you really have to think through that um, segmentation and decide, is it millennials you want to connect with or some portion of it, some of the uh, segments? 
A millennial designed product or service, for example, might not appeal to all millennials. Um, if you're communicating out or marketing, you need to understand how to speak to the different subgroups. Are there specific um, groups within the cohort that you should um, focus that would maybe more relate to your, your offer? Um, because if you get that target or the messaging wrong, you could easily miss the mark. Um, so to sum up, um, millennials um, widely believed to have been this late launch generation. They took their time, got their um, post-secondary credentials. Uh, that meant forming up late, buying homes later. Um, they do appear now to have found their financial footing, um, or at least to be on the way to it. They're tech savvy, as we talked about, and they're really an important market. They're a large cohort, and they are kind of in their um, sweet spot in terms of um, their careers and their financial lives. So they're of interest um, as employees, as consumers, and as donors, et cetera. Um, wanted to close off with just a little bit of a what next. Um, we've started doing work on Gen Z, which is the uh, generation coming up after the millennials. And um, there's a few areas where they stand out as a cohort, um, even compared to the millennials. So they show a stronger rejection of authority than previous generations at that age. Uh, they show a strong commitment to an ecological lifestyle. So they're living that um, environmentalism. They, um, along with that, they have ethical consumerism, which means that they, um, they uh, vote with their wallets, if you will. They, uh, they're trying to live that ecological lifestyle through their, their consumer activities. And they share a belief in the Canadian dream. They're confident that um, you can get ahead um, in, in our society. Um, so, you know, there'll be um, more coming out on uh, Gen Z. Um, there's lots of uh, material on our website if you're interested in reading more about the millennials and uh, I encourage you to check us out. Um, I really hope you have a fantastic conference and I'm really looking forward to the question period. So um, have a great time and I look forward to speaking with you. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much, Tony, for your presentation and Strathcona County for sponsoring this session. Now I would like to invite all of you to join us in the Zoom room for some live Q&A. All you have to do is click on the Zoom link on your screen and I will see you there.